Ladies and gentlemen, human beings around the world, I want to introduce you to Jandell Allen Davis, Dr. Jandell Allen Davis, a physician for 37 years. Her words, privileged and honored to serve patients and families for 25 years while serving in a number of management and leadership roles. Currently, the CEO and president of Craig Hospital. To know Jandell is to know a kind, compassionate, and determined leader who in every conversation makes you a better person. I know you will love listening to her and you will feel her sincere passion for leadership in helping others see and reach their true potential. Thank you, Greg. And hello to the folks all across, it sounds like the globe, um, in terms of what Greg uh, mentioned in his greetings and salutations. And I was standing in the back uh, listening to his comments and said, what a perfect setup for a talk or a conversation I want to have with you all today. Um, and we didn't even rehearse it, didn't even know that this is where we are going to come from. And so I'm going to be talking about this, this notion of what's the antidote to loneliness. It is a pleasure, it is a privilege, it's an honor to be able to share some thoughts, some that really, I hope, touch the deeper part of your soul. And the only way really to touch the deeper part of someone's soul is to be willing to do something that we've talked about for a very, very long time, but to really step into that space as leaders and be courageously vulnerable. Because, in fact, being vulnerable is an act of courage. It can be fearful, it can be very fear-inducing um, at times, but it's super important to do that. So my plan in this little bit of time we get to spend together is to share some of my thoughts um, about wholeheartedness as an antidote to loneliness. Um, you know, the last two years have left many of us feeling quite rudderless, as, as uh, again, Greg had mentioned. And the interesting thing is, just as we think that we're done with one shock, and the big one, of course, having been the pandemic um, that we've been enduring these last two years, um, and we've gone to yet others, whether it was in our own country, the, the social injustice uh, that has come um, and hit us all in the face in a way perhaps differently than what many of us had been living for years back in the summer of 2020. And now here we are facing the potential, frankly, for a global war while watching in horror man's inhumanity to man across the globe. And for sure, those of us who are in healthcare, we have absolutely been at the sharp end of the spear over the last two years with the pandemic. And we're tired, we're exhausted, we're weary, and yet we're ready to move ahead only to face yet more challenges. And this is what I'd call the recovery period of the pandemic and what we've been dealing with. And then I hope at some point we'll be able to get on with rebuilding. But the things that we're facing are workforce shortages, not just in healthcare, but also in, in other industries as well. But certainly they're um, incredibly stark right now in healthcare. All of us are trying to adapt to these new ways of working where some of us are at work full time, some are at work part time, and some are fully at home. And we've done this, we've been thrust into this great experiment around whatever you want to call telecommuting um, all at once with no real time to think about the unintended and, in, and intended consequences of this way of conducting business. Because we've lost some things, for sure. I worry about innovation in this new world. I worry about how we collaborate when we don't have the social connections. And let's face it, we're social creatures. Let alone the impacts of this sort of way of working on our mental and our physical health. We've got inflation that's challenging not just our businesses, but also certainly our homes. And this is probably the biggest and most, um, I think, challenging, but if we can wrap our, hand, our brains around this, our hearts, our minds around this, and begin to deal with this, perhaps we can work our way out of some of these others. There is an epidemic of loneliness right now, epidemic of loneliness and isolation, and it's fueling a mental health crisis, not just in adults, but probably more um, seriously in our youth. So all of this, all of this, and maybe more, has left leaders um, with a new set of challenges. And it feels like, even though I'm sure leaders from every single generation over countless millennia um, have said, oh, this feels like the big one. The, the things we are facing feel like grand challenges, really huge challenges. I think there is something incredibly consequential about the challenges that we're facing today as a, as a world. And so, I've got a few points I want to make today, and we're going to do it, I hope, in an interesting way. So here are the four points I want us to, uh, to, to think about, you out there to think about. First of all, there are decisions and there are actions that can only be made by leaders. And they're typically the bigger ones and the harder ones. And I think that's okay. I think that's actually a good thing. 
The second is that in those moments when we're personally and professionally most challenged, those are those hard looks in the mirror and they make for super fitful sleep, if any sleep at all. The third one is navigating those fights in the arena wherein you're facing not only your teams and your competitors and your customers or those you serve, but most importantly, you're facing yourself. Those can be some of the toughest moments in the arena, but they also can be the most rewarding if you really, really embrace them. And then finally, every single one of those experiences, all the stuff that I've talked about so far, um, no matter how difficult, can be better experienced if you're living a wholehearted life. And we're gonna to come to that in the end. And I thought the way I do it in terms of the setup is I'm gonna do it in four acts. And I'll tell you the names of the acts. The first act is, you know the photo. Act two is the 40 nights and 40 days or the 40 seconds and the 40 minutes or some other unit of measure in the desert. When we go to act three, we're gonna be in the arena. We're gonna actually talk about what it feels like to be down there. And then finally, What's the antidote? What's the cure? I am a physician and certainly I'm working with patients. We always like to help work with them to figure out what is it that we can do to confront and deal with what we are dealing with. And so act four is called the antidote to exhaustion, isolation and loneliness. So let's go ahead and get started. Act one, you know the photo. And I actually went in search of some of them and then decided I'm not doing slides, I'm just gonna chat because you've probably seen it. You know, the one of President John Kennedy or Dr. Martin Luther King Jr., perhaps Madeleine Albright or Ruth Bader Ginsburg or President Obama. You know the one, the one where they're sitting there, sitting alone, sort of looking out. Sometimes their hand, uh, their head may be resting on their hand. They have for sure a pensive look. Um, they may be looking down, they may be looking out and they aren't smiling. Maybe they look a bit weary. As I said, certainly they look pensive, their brow may be furrowed, and their face is impassive. I'll tell you, there isn't one to my knowledge of me looking like that, but I've assumed that position many times over the years that I've been both in leadership and I'd also say in clinical practice. And then there are times even when I don't strike that pose that I'm figuratively in that headspace. You know, I love watching leaders and I've been an unwitting student of leadership for decades is what I think. And I, and I, and I wondered for the longest is how is it that they make decisions? Because my sense of things when I see leaders sitting like that or my sort of image of our more formal leadership or chosen leadership, appointed leadership, is that um, that's what they're doing. They're struggling with something trying to figure out how to make a decision. And I asked myself a, a number of questions. Are they authentic? Are they kind? Do they make their thoughts visible to the world? Can they be trusted? Do they admit mistakes? And are they able, are they able to show vulnerability? But there are a bunch of other questions I also wonder about because I ask them of myself. And I'm gonna take the presumptive liberty as a leader and I'm gonna pose those questions to you and I'm gonna answer them. But I'm gonna to try to put myself in the first person singular here. So do I struggle with hard decisions from time to time? Yes. Do I think about how my, my decisions will impact the lives of those I serve, both my team members as well as our, our patients in my case? Absolutely. Do I try to make the decisions through the lens of do no harm? Well, to the extent that I um, have actually a good sense of what's going on, I try my level best to do no harm. Do I worry about being liked or loved? Yeah, I do. Uh, would I like to be anywhere else but here? I can't tell you the number of times I've looked up and said, hey, why don't you take this one away from me? You, you solve this one, because I don't know how to do it. Yeah, I, there, absolutely there are times I'd rather be anywhere but there. But sometimes for me, I can tell you, that sensation mostly comes up when I'm tired, when I'm having to choose among, from among um, a set of suboptimal options, and when the stakes are highest. So yeah. I summarize all that I've said so far and ask the question, is the big chair, and I realized this some years ago, watching leaders I've served under, or just watching leaders in general, is this the big chair, as I like to call it, is it isolating, is it lonely? And the answer to that is absolutely yes. Leadership can be incredibly lonely. But it's crazy to even think that way when you're surrounded by so many people. Well, you know, when I took this role back in uh, 2018 and was privileged to become the president and CEO of Craig Hospital, I remember the night before the announcement was gonna go public, 
and all the, you know, the, the stuff that goes out on social and the other places. And I remember thinking, this is going to feel like, or I am experiencing this the way it feels like to be um, above the, the, um, up on the top of mountains where you're above the tree line, above the timber line, where you're out on those, those big rocks and a storm is coming in. And you know that you are at risk of potentially being hit by um, uh, lightning. And what that really spoke to me, I remember saying to myself, I feel so exposed. And that is absolutely some of how leadership can feel if you're not thinking about it, I think, in the right way. So I, I, I think I've experienced this. In fact, I know I, I've experienced this common part of leading. And I've seen how others experience it. And we're going to come back to that. You know, there's a, a quote that kind of comes to mind. And in fact, we shouldn't ever say it with a grin on our face. But I do remember President uh, George Bush saying at one point, it's hard. And it is hard. It is hard. Um, and, but I think it also speaks to this epidemic of the loneliness that we're, we're all facing. So that's act one. You know the photo. You know what it feels like, that sense of just isolation exposure. Act two, let's go to that one. That's the 40 nights or the 40 days in the desert, or the 40 seconds or the 40 minutes, or some other unit of measure in the desert. It's always the most challenging work or those most challenging decisions that wake me up. I'm also very old, so I always wake up at 2 anyway, 2 in the morning. Um, and there I am, and I'm awake, and I'm staring at the ceiling, or I'm tossing and turning. And so I just said, I, let me do a little bit of reading about what does it mean to do this 40 days or 40 nights in the desert. And I did find one thing in terms of the, uh, the Bible um, that has made reference to 40 days. And there's a number of references in the Bible to this notion of 40 days. And in my own practice, interestingly, as an OBGYN, um, pregnancy is typically 40 weeks in duration. So there's something special about that number in general. But I loved this quote. Scripture beckons us to embark on our own 40-day exodus. And it equips us, it equips us with many models for their spiritual sojourns whether it's to weather our own floods, survive the desert, or slay our own Goliaths. I'll tell you, those moments of struggle are at the heart of sitting and looking like those leaders in the photo. And in my experience, it's a time of questioning my own values and beliefs, taking my own pulse, and really working through why I might be stuck, a word that actually Greg used this morning, and realizing that a good deal of the reason I'm stuck, and this is a a real moment of vulnerability, but I think it's one that you all need to ask yourself to. Typically when I'm stuck, it's because I'm focused on my ego or my own ego needs. And here are some of them. The need to be right. The need to be liked. The need to belong. The need not to screw stuff up. And most importantly, the need but to live by mission and purpose. And thankfully, after I work my way through this and I can get back to values and beliefs and mission and purpose, even though it's sometimes hard, I hope I do, or I certainly strive to do the right thing. But there's some other reasons why I can be stuck. I can be stuck because I haven't been as attentive to a thing or a work as I should be or should have been. Um, you know, one of the harder things that we as leaders have to really struggle with is this crazy um, sort of a dichotomy of you can't know it all but you feel highly accountable to know it all. And then we're going to come back to that one, because there is an answer to that, I believe. But maybe it's that you just really weren't, I wasn't listening when the problem was being presented to me because of the multiple tapes that may be playing in my head or that ridiculous word we made up that is impossible, it's elusive, and we should stop it, called multitasking. Or maybe it's just pure overload or pure over feeling overwhelmed. Well. So to the extent that you're familiar with the teachings of Christ, and I'm not here to be um, ministerial at all, but you know that those times of challenge are typically about facing and doing something you know you need to do and don't want to. There are things you know you need to do, but you don't want to. And what I've learned, another thing that got referenced already this morning about these times, is that the dragon is in my head. And he grows, or she grows and grows when I'm in this headspace and incites imaginable and sometimes real fear. And you can physiologically experience it as well. And it's often just that. It's the dragon in my head. I've made it all up. And it's in those lonely moments, though, when, when I can get my sea legs back, when I can sort of pull myself back from the, the cliff, often with help, there's a miraculous thing that happens. 
It's a miraculous thing that emerges, and it's called courage. Courage emerges, and it's in those moments that then I have to recall this quote that I actually remember Palm Pilots. I had it on the top of my Palm Pilot every day just to remind me. Courage is fear that said its prayers. That's all it is. Courage is fear that said its prayers. And I've been known, although nobody would know I do this except now lots of people out there listening, is that I, when I'm walking into a challenging situation or meeting, I repeat that mantra again and again. All it is is fear that said its prayers. That's what courage is. And then I find myself after I've emerged from and we figured out or I've finished the conversation or the, whatever I'm doing, saying, and actually too many times to recount, so you'd think I'd learned, is that that wasn't as awful as I made it out to be. Or actually it was as awful as I thought it was going to be, but I survived and so did the person. Or, you know what, I got there the best way I know how. I did it with kindness, I did it with respect, and I stuck to the decision or the opinion. And oh my, the next day the sun came out any old way. So that's act two. It's that, that whole uh, notion of the struggle, the 40 days, the 40 nights, the 40 seconds, 40 minutes in the arena, I mean in the, uh, in the desert. But act three is in the arena. You know, a good deal about what I've discovered about the loneliness of leadership is about calming myself enough to think clearly to get clear about my role in whatever's going on and to trust, and this is, I've sort of let little um, uh, hints about this all along, to trust that I never actually do any of this, do any of this alone. That you don't accomplish these things, you accomplish them alongside others. And you know, I can always check what's going on against the life and death decisions as a physician. And I asked myself, since I stopped all clinical practice in 2009 and went into pure administration, I'd find myself having to ask the question, is there blood on the floor? Has anybody died? Or is anybody at risk of dying? And there are absolutely analogies in business where there is blood on the floor, but they're precious and few. So the most important thing that I can do in those instances is just take my own pulse, as it's been said. And I don't ask those questions lightly either. Uh, but when it's all said and done, I gotta be good living with whatever the decision that, it, that I've made. Because let's face it, and this is another one of those huge, I suppose, existential moments in terms of what we do. We came here alone and we leave alone. So I've gotta be able to look myself in the mirror and feel as if I've done the right thing when I'm brushing my teeth and washing my, my face. And I ask myself a few questions. Another thing, to, it's always good right before you go to bed to reflect. Did you do your best? I'm sorry, did I do my best today? Who did I help? To whom do I need to make amends? Did I live my values? Was I honest? And did mission and purpose drive my decisions and acts today? Another wonderful passage, um, back to the arena concept that keeps me very much buoyed when I'm in these crazy times, is to remember uh, uh, President uh, Roosevelt's citizenship in a republic, and that one little segment from it that I'd uh, love the opportunity to read to you. And what he said is, it's not the critic who counts, not the man or woman who points out how the strong man or woman stumbles or where the doer of deeds could have done them better. The credit belongs to the man who's actually in the arena, whose face is marred by dust and sweat and blood, who strives valiantly, who errs, who comes up short again and again because there's no effort, there's no effort without error or shortcoming, but who does actually strive to do the deeds, who knows the great enthusiasms, the great devotions, who spends himself in a worthy, worthy cause, who at best knows in the end the triumph of high achievement, and who at worst, if he fails, at least fails daring greatly, so that his place shall never be with those cold and timid souls who neither know victory nor defeat. You know, it's an incredible passage, and you can actually even see it. I mean, it's what many of us live, not daily, thankfully, although I'll tell you these last two years uh, working alongside my incredible teammates at Craig Hospital, I can tell you that um, we have all felt like we've been down in that arena, keeping COVID-19 uh, out of our patient population and keeping our patients as safe as we could while continuing to provide the care that we do. So we know what that feels like. It is an incredible passage, but one of my uh, realizations just in preparing this uh, time with you that I realized that there's somebody else up in those stands. There actually is someone else. And yes, there's the critic 
and those other folks. It could be team members, it could be friends, it could be foes. But guess who is more often one of the most vocal critics out in that arena? I know you know what I was going to say. It's you. It's me. It's not me for you, but it's me for me, you for you. Um, and that you, and in fact that inner critic, are far more corrosive and harmful um, to, to, um, any, than any of the side eye that somebody else might throw to you. And in my case, I'll tell you, she's a small child, full of fears, and it's born out of my origin story. And that's who I'm wrestling with in those twilight hours. And I have learned that until I can chill her out, get her just to quiet down, my thinking is going to be muddled, and I'm going to be much less effective. And that's when I have to tell her to go sit down somewhere and let big girl Jandell handle this. Because I'm reminded and would counsel you to remember that and trust that the great paradox is that those decisions are never made alone. They're always made with other people. You are never alone. Which leads me to the final act, so I can get on with this thing. And that is the antidote to exhaustion, isolation, and loneliness. My favorite poet is an Anglo-Irish man named David White. And I discovered him probably 20 years ago. And I devour everything he writes. He manages to step into my life exactly when I need him to. And he actually did tell a really interesting and particular story about exhaustion. And he said, when you're at a point where you don't know how to take the next step, I often think you have to ask for two kinds of help. One is the visible help and the other is invisible, and it's there to help you along the way. And so one night he decided to um, sit down with a, um, a friend of his, a Benedictine monk named Brother David Stendel Rast, and um, they were going to drink some wine and, and read some Rilke, the German poet, um, and, and read them in some English translations. And they always drink wine when they do that. So they're sitting there, and he'd had a pretty stressful day. And he felt like he was in a dead end where he was, because he had just decided that he was going to go, he was going to leave the nonprofit work and go and be a full-time poet. And so he said, as he says in a Khalil Gibran-like way to Brother David, speak to me of exhaustion. And he put his glass down for a moment, and he looked at me to see if he, I was being serious. And he realized that I was, that I was absolutely exhausted myself. And he said the most wonderful thing. And this is where the invisible help came. He said, you know, David, the antidote to exhaustion is not necessarily rest. And David repeated, the antidote to exhaustion is not necessarily rest. The antidote isn't rest, then what is it? And he told him that the antidote to exhaustion is wholeheartedness. This is the point where you have to take a full step into your meteor, into your future vocation, and wholeheartedly risk yourself in that world. You know, he has another poem called Sweet Darkness that invites us to reset our relationship with many aspects of our life, including our work. And there's a particular line from that poem that, boy, this one, talk about a line that's devastating in its beauty. And the line is, anything or anyone that does not bring you fully alive is too small for you. I found that when I'm feeling exhausted or that the world is too small for me, it is often I who have created the context for, that, for those feelings to emerge. And at those times, David White says in the same poem, when your eyes are tired, the world is tired also. When your vision is gone, no part of the world can find you. Time to go into the dark where the night has eyes to recognize its own. There you can be sure you are not beyond love. The dark will be your womb tonight. The night will be a, you, give you a horizon further than you can see. You must learn one thing. The world was made to be free in. And he goes on to say some other things. But in the interest of time, what I'm going to tell you that I learned in those two things, and I have to remind myself of this from time to time, because this is important work. It's an honor and a privilege to, to be a leader, to serve. But at the same time, it can be exhausting. And I have to say, OK, let me take my own pulse, check out where I am, and ask myself, in what ways have I made my world too small? What is this antidote to, exha an antidote to exhaustion that uh, White speaks of? And so I wrote, I, I do these CEO reflections as my team at Craig knows uh, periodically, and I'll send a writing out to the whole hospital. And the one that I wrote for the New Year was all about wholeheartedness. And here's what I think. Here's 
this Dr. Jandell Allen Davis prescription for making your way forward. And all of the words start with RE, so you can get your pen out. And you may even add some, and please let me know if you do. Here's my list for wholeheartedness. The first one actually is rest. Um, it's important to sleep and to slow down. Um, fatigue is a real thing, and we're learning more and more from the perspective of overall impacts on health that one of the, that the most important out of physical activity, eating, and, um, and, and sleep is sleep. So rest is important. Refresh, sometimes just taking a moment to breathe deeply can be uplifting. Retreat, making and finding space, however brief, to put yourself in a space of quiet and solitude can do wonders for the soul. Re recreate, literally getting time for physical activity, sometimes the sweaty kinds and sometimes just the walk in nature can really do it for me and I hope for you. Recreate. Committing to something completely new that you've wanted to try or didn't know you wanted to try but took the risk anyway and in turn learned a new thing that you do only for you. Rejuvenate. We always think of the new year as a time to get more focused on some aspect of health, but you can do it at any time. Could be committing just to drink more water every day or smiling more or laughing. Maybe a new look. Rediscover, what if you picked up that violin that you used to play some years ago and started playing it again or started painting again? Reflect, all those questions that I talked about earlier, asking yourself at the end of the day, taking a moment to do that. And then finally, reconnecting, which is one I added just today. Whose door haven't I darkened in a while? Who haven't I checked in on? Doing those things, it's amazing what it does for you. So in closing, I do want to talk just a touch about Dr. Murphy, Murphy's uh, book called Together. In the book, he purports that the world is suffering from an epidemic of loneliness, and he's actually declared this a public health crisis. And it makes sense in light of our mental and physical health challenges. And he proposes a list of four actions that in reading it, I realize all those RE words beautifully nest underneath them somewhere and we have the opportunity to leverage them. It's four things, a lot simpler than my RE list. Spend time each day with those you love, and I pray that some of them, if not many of them, are at work, given how much time we spend together. Focus on each other. Put down things. You can't multitask. Really try and work on mindfulness and presence. Embrace solitude. Not loneliness, not isolation, but a little bit of time where you can quiet the world and embrace those few moments just to be solitude. And then finally, the one that I think is the most amazing, it's help and be helped. Help others and allow others to help you. I will tell you back to that uh, notion of the isolation, of the isolation and the loneliness that's part of leadership and some of the toughest decisions. It's always easier when I knock on the door of a colleague or walk down the hall or even just go up and talk to patients and the nurses who I have the, 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 uh, the incredible privilege of, of serving. So back to those pensive moments in your own life and leadership, those moments wherein the way isn't clear, forward isn't clear, where you have to do it yourself and you can't do it alone, those isolating moments, those lonely moments, the most important thing you can do for yourself to use the phrase is to secure your own oxygen mask. Selfishly put yourself first in order to serve others at your very best. That's what's required of us. Thank you.